evening's uh, presentation, which is uh, a forum, discussion, dialogue, and uh, also conversation among all of us with uh, two of uh, certainly the uh, most interesting and creative uh, personalities in uh, contemporary culture. Richard Foreman, theater director extraordinaire, and Colin Wilson, novelist, sociologist, and uh, philosopher of uh, well-deserved repute, of course. And um, what's going to happen is that uh, <clears throat> Colin's going to be uh, speaking for first for about 10 minutes, and then Richard will follow. And then uh, they'll sort of dialogue for a while. And then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience and responses from people in the audience and uh, let it go from there. I guess I just want to start out by saying again, thanks for uh, coming to uh, this presentation tonight. And uh, um, please uh, feel free to uh, check our catalog out, which we have in the lobby. You know, um, this event is also part of a long-term series in holistic studies that uh, is uh, being inaugurated this year by the Open Center. Um, and uh, we're hoping that uh, those who participate uh, take, you know, opportunity to, uh, you know, experience the wide variety of things we've tried to include in this year-long uh, program, which is mentioned in the catalog. Also, there's a tape being made of this lecture. It's going to be unedited, and those tapes will be available uh, by mail order. You should speak to Kevin, who's uh, recording this. He's sitting right over there in the corner um, afterward, and uh, he'd be able to take your order. Um, so I'll just uh, say a few brief things uh, by way of biography about each. Uh, Colin Wilson uh, has been uh, active, you know. Sure, sure. Colin Wilson has been active as a uh, writer, um, well-known and internationally renowned writer since the 60s, beginning in 1956 uh, for most of us with a publication of a book called The Outsider, but has since gone on to write widely about contemporary culture from political, historical, sociological, uh, mystical viewpoints, and certainly uh, is well known for his investigations of paranormal phenomena and all those sorts of things. He did ask me to mention that currently he's uh, researching the uh, Sphinx and uh, is uh, writing a book which discusses the idea that the uh, Egyptian civilization uh, had a completely different basis for thinking on a cognitive level, perhaps, than what we would even imagine could be possible in modern times, <clears throat> and uh, offering up certain things which arise from studying the Egyptian culture and monuments and so on that point to this kind of uh, speculation. So I'm sure that that will be interesting um, and will be forthcoming. Richard, I know personally uh, through working at the Ontological Hysteric Theater, and uh, I can say that uh, he too is uh, someone who has been interested over the years in exploring those other ways of looking at things and those other ways of being which seem to originate from deep within us that are variously referred to as mystical experiences and aesthetic experiences or what have you, but really in character it would seem to me basically lie outside of the realm of social conditioning and some would say even uh, human morality or even human normal human conceptions of time and space and all these sorts of things and uh, but what they reflect is a place where uh, creativity comes from as in my opinion where uh, the qu basic questions of human freedom are raised and then answered variously and there have been various answers in human history, and um, one answer has been that uh, I think that Richard has been most interested in is the idea of not knowing the gnosis that surrounds our confrontation with our own finite conception of ourselves and the world that we live in. Um, which, of course, brings us back to that place where 
we're outside of our frameworks of understanding and we're watching what happens. So uh, Colin's idea of peak experiences and Richard's uh, reverberation machines, as it were, those kinds of theatrical oppositions between love and hatred and action and immobility and character and robot-likeness of the human condition alternating and existing simultaneously in a kind of dissonance, you might say, seem to me to be very interesting in the sense that they both point to the paradox of the fact that we seem to know and don't know about ourselves and everything else all at the same time. So let's uh, open, our, uh, open up this thing to the people who really need to be talking, uh, Colin Wilson and Richard Foreman. Uh, thank you. Also, Richard did ask me to mention that... No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I came to know Richard because a few years ago, when I came to the Open Center, uh, Richard allowed me to stay in his flat while he was away producing an opera in Canada. And uh, I was immensely impressed by the enormous number of books that he has in the place. Uh, all kinds of books that interested me very much, and um, many of them books I'd never seen before. I ended by taking a list of about 50 of them, all of which I ordered from my bookshop as soon as I got back to England. I was bewildered by the uh, sheer extent of his interests. He um, had left one of his own books behind for me, and uh, a book of his plays. But this I found very bewildering. Uh, I could not seem to get a grip on it at all. And uh, I just concluded that, you know, this really was not for me. And yet it struck me, on the other hand, that there was something very strange about this. I mean, after all, if, um, if Richard enjoyed my work and he had a lot of it on his shelves, then I ought to be able to understand exactly what he was saying. Now, uh, the other evening, I went along to see Richard's I've Got the Shakes and uh, was startled how beautifully it came over on stage. <laughs> what a, a brilliant and impressive and very funny piece it was. And for the first time, I really began to see what he was doing, although I'd been making notes for this talk for the past two months. What struck me very clearly with the, uh, I've Got the Shakes was, first of all, you know, that it was funny. Uh, it seemed to be a mixture of Kafka, Alice in Wonderland, and The Wizard of Oz. And uh, the next thing that struck me was that this peculiar disconnection of the action, which had worried me so much when I read it on the page, seemed to be absolutely perfect on the stage that, you know, really, this is a case where it has to be seen. Now, we talked about our work uh, the same afternoon, and I'd said that it struck me that, in some ways, his aims were akin to those of Andy Warhol, um, whom Richard knew. And he said, yes, I went to see all of those Warhol films when they were first uh, shown in New York several times, I said, the one that fascinated me was the one at the front of the Empire State Building, just watching it for hours. And he said, oh, the one that fascinated me was the one about sleep, watching somebody sleeping. He said, because you watched it for a long time, uh, feeling, as it were, blank and bored, and then quite suddenly the boredom itself pushed you through to a new level. And then suddenly, for the first time, I really began to understand you see, the reason that I didn't understand before <clears throat> is that in the Western tradition, particularly the, the modern Western tradition of literature, there are two distinct strands. One is the rationalist strand, of people like Shaw and H.G. Wells and Bertrand Russell, and the other one is you know, the symbolic strand of people like Kafka, the James Joyce of the night town scene of Ulysses, and um, I very positively belong um, to the Shaw and Bertrand Russell strand. When I, uh, Richard's wife, Kate, came along to hear me lecture that time in New York, uh, 
as she came out of the first lecture, she said to me, my God, you're a rationalist, aren't you? And I said, you're bloody right I am. Because it seems to me that in a sense, you know, our only salvation lies in reason and in pushing reason as far as it will go. Now, this division between the, the rationalist and the, the symbolist did not exist in, say, the year 1800. Um, someone like Goethe was um, capable of writing <clears throat> absolutely clearly and scientifically. He was a rationalist, all right, yet at the same time was capable of writing extraordinary symbolic things like the, the fairy tale and the second part of Faust, which I personally find completely incomprehensible. They didn't, it didn't strike them that there were two different strands. It was only later in the 19th century that these two began to break apart. And the reason they broke apart is that the writers themselves became increasingly miserable, finding that the world was too much for them. So that people like Shaw, who took a rationalist point of view and thought that socialism was the answer to all the problems of the human race, was completely incomprehensible to someone like W.B. Yeats, um, the poet who felt that the world is something he wanted to turn his back on. I love this quotation of Yeats. He said that Ruskin had once said to his father, as I go each day to the British Museum, I find the faces of those around me becoming more and more corrupt. And I can understand why Yeats wanted to feel this was true. That in a sense, he felt there's another world, a more interesting world than this that we are stuck in at the moment. That if you were stuck on this level all the time, you would go mad. That somehow you've got to go deeper, deeper inside yourself, descend in yourself as if descending in an elevator to some far deeper level. And I realize that in a certain sense, Yeats is a kind of religious poet. Yet in another sense, Shaw was also obsessed by religion. Clearly the two in a sense are very close together. You can't really make this division. So the split that has happened since then, this split into the rationalists on the one hand, and you know what I call, for want of a better word, the symbolists, people like Kafka on the other, is not a real split at all. There must be a way you know, in which the two come together. Of course, this really began to appear very clearly in the 1930s and the 1940s with the coming of existentialism, because the essence of existentialism was this feeling that the ordinary world, the world in which you know, we find ourselves thrown, whether we like it or not, is somehow boring and irritating. Kafka had said that he found the world a totally alien place and said, you know, in the struggle between yourself and the world, always take the world's side. And Kierkegaard, of course, had said, you know, what am I doing here? What is this thing called world? Why am I in it? Um, who was it who threw me into this place and keeps me here? Take me to see the director. I want to see the director. And this feeling of total bewilderment is the essence of existentialism. Uh, expressed, of course, by Sartre in that novel, Nausea, his first novel written in 1937, in which the hero feels that somehow reality is alien and that the rest of the world is too stupid to notice how alien it is. And what Sartre was really saying, in a way, was that it's like a rich man who has a servant whom he treats purely as a servant never recognizing that he's a human being and that we treat the external world as a kind of servant of ourselves imposing our view upon it and that you know it has a reality of its own which um, for Rocantin in nausea periodically totally overwhelmed him and made him feel negated by the sheer brute reality of the external world, what William James called stubborn, irreducible fact. He also called it the absurd. And Camus took over this word absurd from him 
in his first book, um, L'Etranger, The Stranger, in which, again, you have this feeling of meaninglessness, pointlessness. And this is expressed best in Camus' first little book, The Myth of Sisyphus, in which he talks about the sheer boredom of everyday life. You go to work, you come home for lunch, you go to work, you come home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and so on for month after month until suddenly, he said, the absurd dawns upon you and for the first time you really begin to live. This feeling that the world is basically absurd is the basic feeling behind all existentialism. But what worried me about this is that Camus gave, as an example of the absurd, somebody in a phone box, frantically making some emotional call, and you see his face behind the glass, twisted and distorted with emotion, but you can't hear a thing. And he said, suddenly the absurd hits you. Now that's all very well, but you realize the absurd by withdrawing an element of reality from the situation, his voice, the reality behind it. In the same way, if you watch an orchestra tuning up, you might well feel that this was totally absurd and meaningless. And if you really felt that the whole thing was so absurd, you'd actually hear a Beethoven symphony as equally absurd and meaningless. It seemed to me that the problem with Camus was that he'd withdrawn so far that in this state of withdrawal, everything appears to be absurd. Yet the only time I met Camus, who was um, my publisher, um, he worked for Gallimars, who brought out The Outsider, he struck me as the happiest man I'd ever come across. His eyes literally sparkled. He seemed to be giving out a terrific amount of vital energy. What puzzled me very much was that Camus' death was so absurd. Um, the phone rang one day in 1960 and a voice said, ah, Mr. Wilson. I said, yeah. He said, have you heard that Albert Camus is dead? Now, I thought this was a friend of mine called Bill Hopkins who was always ringing me up claiming to be a Chinese laundry or somebody trying to recruit people for a Russian brothel. And I said, ah, oh, you know, come on off it. And he finally convinced me that he really was a genuine news um, reporter. And it turned out that Camus had been driving in the back of a car and which had swerved off the road and hit a tree and had been thrown through the back window. Now, how does that happen when you hit a tree? <laughs> the absurd. <laughs> But it struck me suddenly, uh, thinking about this, that Camus' death was so typical of the view he'd determinedly taken, which I found, you know, an incredibly worrying thing. He'd written again and again about people dying in a totally absurd way. Out of sheer self-protection, <laughs> I've always done my best to remain unaware of the absurd. <laughs> Nietzsche once said, I've made my philosophy out of my will to health. And I've discovered the necessity of keeping myself up, you know, particularly on something like, you know, this lecture trip, where um, I find myself very often, because of the time lag, getting into states of immense tiredness, and then forcing myself into a state, you know, in which, quite suddenly, if I push hard enough, I break through some inner barrier, get what William James called second wind, and then, you know, apparently discover that I have enormous energy reserves inside me. This, in a way, sounds like a criticism of Richard, and in a sense, it's intended to be. And yet, when we talked the other afternoon, and he began to explain his basic ideas, I began to see that, in fact, you know, I'd somehow got it subtly wrong. <laughs> so I'm going to throw this now at Richard. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I... I, we were very excited to, uh, at that time years ago when Colin uh, came to New York and was looking for a place to stay because indeed uh, I think we have practiced, well, I think we have every book that uh, Colin ever wrote. Uh, so I admire him, I enjoy him, and as we talk uh, it comes clear to me that uh, I really don't agree with him, which I think is the healthiest uh, kind of way to have a discussion. Uh, 
Uh, since I was a kid, I had been uh, a young man who was able to talk well, who was able to write papers well. luminaries of my day. I tried to write a play like Giraudoux. I tried to write a play like Sartre. I tried to write a play like Brecht. As time went on, somewhat because I finally got introduced to advanced American art, uh, I began to curse whatever articulateness I had and began to hope that someday I would be able to make touch with that part of myself that could no longer control grammar, could no longer control syntax, but would begin to babble. Uh, perhaps this dream of infantilism uh, has been achieved earlier by 20th century writers like Gertrude Stein. Uh, Wyndham Lewis wrote uh, a famous book in his day about the infantilism of advanced literature. Uh, Gertrude Stein being the chief luminary, but also sort of putting Joyce in that bag. And we have to talk a little about uh, Colin's opinion about Finnegan's Wake, which I think will lead us into a very interesting discussion about contemporary art. Uh, to me, I remember when I was a young man reading Colin's discussions about faculty X, about the way that one could train the mind, as he just spoke to us, to lift oneself out of the sloth, out of the boredom of one's ordinary day-to-day -day progression through life. Yeah, I want to do that. I want to be happy. I want to be lifted out of my sloth, and I'm a very slothful person. <laughs> but, uh, and I really am. But as an artist, I feel that that isn't too helpful to me. Because one of the reasons that I've been so ambivalent about even the art that I love, uh, is that I have been interested in states of transcendence and yet when art tries to deal with that I usually feel that it's like writing postcards of a place that you would like to be and you're not there and as a result you get a sort of sentimentalized version of what could be and it has always seemed to me that the real task of art was somehow not to scapegoat the bad state that you're in or the negative emotions that you have and push them to the side and show a dichotomy, uh, show a conflict between the absurd, the rational, the paradisical, the uh, hellish, but rather to accept the fact that life is this stumbling thing going off in 20 directions at once you are, each of you, me, Colin, we are all implicated in that moment-by-moment moment failure that is being human, except perhaps for fully realized human beings who, perhaps because of the limitation of our perception, seems to me have not created great art. Now, maybe it's not particularly desirable to create great art, but it seems to me that something interesting and new is happening in art now that does not represent the necessity of the choice between this rational and symbolist mode. It seems to me that what's happening is that art is really, advanced 20th century art is really trying to seek out the totally paradoxical moment that cannot be controlled. It's kind of art of negative theology only. Uh, Colin speaks about this faculty X and this means to get into a happier state. I would claim that the task is to live in the shit, if you will, but discover a way to live that so that your energy is not sapped by the negative. To, um, to create a density, to create, in a sense, an incomprehensibility that echoes the ultimate incomprehensibility of the world, echoes our total failure to understand, because I was joking with Colin the other day when he was at the house, 
Uh, I find Collins theorizing very stimulating and very persuasive in a certain sense. Nevertheless, I don't think that the history of philosophy is now finished because Colin has solved all our problems. Obviously, Colin has solved our problems so that one can see where, ah, but you made a mistake and your solutions create ever new problems. Now, to me, that is the human condition. And the interesting thing about advanced 20th century art is that it tries to not express, not define, but to embody that continual paradox of a human being, of human effort, reaching the cusp of understanding and then immediately falling back down into the trough of blankness. Um, before coming here, I, first of all, I was thrilled because I, th I, I assumed Colin had read everything. But I mentioned uh, contemporary poet Paul Celan, who quite a few, you know, there's a body of opinion that thinks Celan is the greatest 20th century poet, and I was delighted. I knew somebody that he uh, didn't know, and I was going to read a, a poem of saying, well, maybe I will read a little something, just simply as a gift <laughs> to Colin. And I just opened this book at random. Um, and it seems to me that Celan uh, represents that continual stumbling of language over the inexpressible, which indeed creates the inexpressible for the critic, the philosopher, to then try and conquer. And I look upon the artist's task as giving people like Colin new problems. I want to give him problems. You know, he has it, he has it all solved now, mm -hmm. but I want to upset his apple cart. And I think that's what most artists want to do. Uh, here's a poem. I just opened the book at random. You lie beyond yourself. Beyond yourself lies your fate. White-eyed, it has fled from a song. Something comes forth. It's useful in the tearing of tongues from their roots, even in the afternoon, out there. Uh, one other little thing I want you to read, because uh, I went to the bookstore, and to, to add to my wonderful library, I thought, you know, bought about ten books, and I've reached the point, I've reached old age, I think, where I'm continually coming across books thinking, oh, I want that. But wait a minute, don't I have that? Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, I did not buy the uh, latest uh, collection of uh, Kennedy's uh, aphorisms. Uh, I marked them. I'm not, I marked about 20 of them. But I'm going to limit myself to the last one because time is passing. Uh, it seems to me this is the kind of art that I'm interested in in the 20th century. Uh, represented mostly by poets, a few writers of uh, narrative like uh, Maurice Marchot. Well, here, here is Kennedy. Very simple. To say no with open arms. <laughs> That's what I think I spend my life doing. Uh, this isn't really a reply to this, but when um, The Outsider was in proof, I went along to a party in Hampstead and <clears throat> was introduced to Elias Canetti, and uh, we immediately liked one another immensely. We were obviously very much on the same wavelength. Canetti was totally unknown. He'd written um, one single book, uh, Oto da Fe, which had been out of print for many years. It had been lent to me by someone, and I found it a very interesting and impressive book, although rather depressing. Anyway, um, when my publisher was trying to find uh, people who would review The Outsider, he said, "Ah, oh, you know Canetti. I wonder if Canetti would be interested in reviewing The Outsider. So I wrote to Canetti and received back a very stiff letter from his wife. Mr. Canetti never reviews books. And from this point on, Canetti never contacted me again. And I thought, what a cunt. And I've felt this ever since. That somehow, you know, they eventually, in due course, he published the book on the crowd. He um, published um, various books of aphorisms and then got the Nobel Prize. <laughs>
a friend of mine came around the other day, the one who'd lent me out at a fay. Um, and um, an English novelist called Rudy, Rudy Nassar. And I said, do you ever see Canetti these days? And Rudy said, no, he's completely got beyond himself. He said, I went to see him in Geneva, which is where I think he lives now. And he said, you know, he's become so grand that it's impossible to speak to him. Uh, Canetti published his autobiography um, in the States and refused to publish it in England because he felt resentful of the English for not acknowledging his early work. And again, my feeling is, what a cunt. I mean, the whole thing is negative, vicious, interned. He may be a good writer, but this, why um, Sartre calls this magical thinking, uh, this tendency to um, allow your own emotions to impose themselves on the world. I call it upside-downness. Uh, which means, briefly, that we all have a mind, emotions, and a body. And on the whole, the body sort of often causes you problems, but they don't worry you too much because you're used to being caused problems by your body. You know, you have a bad stomach ache or something of the sort. It doesn't really worry you because you know it'll go away. But when your emotions cause you problems, this is much, much more difficult. What you have to do is keep the mind in control at the top. The emotions underneath, with the Grand Vizier looking after the minor jobs. But if the Grand Vizier usurps the place of the Emperor and takes over the state, the state becomes very unhappy because the Grand Vizier was never intended to be the Emperor. Well, what happens when you get terribly emotional is that the emotions take over so completely, and if they are allowed to use up the reason, you turn upside down as if your feet had turned into enormous balloons, and suddenly your head is down there and your feet are in the air. Or serial killers, for example, are in a state of upside downness. They justify themselves, they talk about the rottenness of authority, about the fact that the police and the government are no good, as if somehow this was a justification for killing people. Upside downness. A friend of mine in New York years ago told me that he'd got completely sick of the traffic jams, had got out of his car and gone to the cinema in the middle of a traffic jam. Of course, he got fined a couple of hundred dollars. He said it was worth it. Upside downness. It seems to me that Canetti is an example of upside downness, and I don't like the man. Not just because I feel he was an idiot years ago, but um, simply because I feel this is the wrong attitude to the world. Now, you say that um, I am criticizing him from a purely personal point of view. And, you know, ad hominem. I don't mind, you know. It seems to me that um, you have to judge writers ad hominem because that's what they are. Colin, everybody would agree. See, my problem is, I mean, I, I got the sense that Kennedy wasn't such a nice guy either. But, <laughs> and everybody would certainly agree that uh, one should live one's life in something resembling the way you are describing. The problem I have is that for me, art is not life. Art can be, you know, we eliminate smallpox. How do we eliminate smallpox? With a little vaccine. Uh, one of the functions of art, one of the ways that art can operate is as a kind of vaccine a vaccine for all the faculties, working out. I mean, there's a little bit of poison in you, there's a little bit of poison in me, and I find it useful for art to take me to the gym where some of those negative emotions in me are worked out also. I just, I can't let, I never met Kennedy, of course, but I can't let uh, Kennedy pass without telling my little Kennedy story that's in one of his uh, autobiographical books where he talks about my favorite 20th century writer, Heimito von Doderer. And uh, Doderer relates, by the way, to all this stuff we're talking about in a, in a way I shall explain in a moment. But Kennedy said he met Doderer, who was probably even more arrogant than Kennedy, at a party. And uh, Doderer looked at him and said, hmm, have you ever killed anybody? And Kennedy said, no. Doderer said, you haven't lived. <laughs> and <laughs> turned away and went uh, uh, to someone else at the party. Uh, Doderer is interesting to me 
because the basic theme of many of Dodera's major books is the way in which all human beings construct what he calls a second reality uh, in which they install themselves. In other words, I have created the second reality of my own little aesthetic world and I make my plays and I am, I am prevented by that second reality from really making contact with whatever is real out there. And I would like to talk about what's real in Lacanian, Freudian terms, which I know horrifies to a certain extent Colin. But Colin is in the second reality of this uh, powerful theory that he has spun about what human beings are and what human beings should be. And again, I'd have to insist that for me, uh, art is a way to trip you up so that you must fall out of your powerful constructed second realities and bump your head against the real. And the real is sometimes ecstatic, sometimes peaceful, sometimes violent, sometimes unpleasant, but art isn't life. And to experience those bumps in the head in art, I think, if properly controlled, can be an extremely important therapeutic experience. Yep, I agree totally. I'm with this. I wouldn't disagree for a moment. The problem is that um, I don't really need tripping up. <laughs> I get tripped up every day. You see, I live quietly in Cornwall with my wife and my children when they're, when they're down. And I take my dog out for a walk every afternoon. But, um, you know, life is difficult. Um, I, um, for example, you know, I, I have to work sort of fairly hard. If I, I met Compton McKenzie um, in the last years of his life, lying in a four-poster bed, and I said, my God, you must have made an immense amount of money from your books. And seeing my implication, he said, if I stopped writing tomorrow, I'd be starving a month hence. Well, that's true for me. So, you know, life in some ways is difficult. Also, I live in England, which is a kind of cultural desert. And um, it really is the most intellectually dead country in the world. I come to America to sort of be able to breathe deeply again and meet people who are interested in ideas. And so, you know, life is difficult. Um, the main problem in my teens was that um, I could never believe that what I felt to be intellectually true could ever establish itself in my mind with enough reality to combat the sheer boredom and misery and humiliation of everyday life. Uh, I suppose I was lucky uh, with the publication of The Outsider when I was 24. It solved the practical problems, but then almost immediately the critics turned against me and slaughtered my second book, and I've been slaughtering my books ever since. So, you know, when I come to America, it's marvelous. Somebody in Japan said <coughs> to me a few years ago, the Japanese have about 70 of my books in print. Ah, Mr. Wilson, in England, you must be as famous as Charles Dickens. And I said, in England, nobody has ever heard of me. And uh, so, you know, it's not true that I, I need tripping up by art. I have my problems. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you one personal one. I spent two years writing what I feel to be my greatest work, an enormous novel called Metamorphosis of the Vampire. I let it go on and on because I felt it really was turning into my Lord of the Rings. Uh, I finished this um, more than nine months ago. Uh, so far it's been turned down by four publishers and still hasn't found a publisher anywhere in the world. Um, you know, it'll find a publisher sooner or later. but. Uh, you know, life is not easy. And so, my own feeling is that, you know, when the, um, the first rejection came in of that novel, which I was convinced was brilliant from the first word. You see when you read it, it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's a great novel. I was convinced, you know, that he would be taken by the first publisher who read the first page. The sort of bewilderment of this thing being rejected produced an immense leaden feeling inside of me, then I had an interesting thought. I thought, um, your emotions feel badly battered at the moment. You're in a state of upside-downness. That upside-downness is going to last. 
for, you know, days, maybe weeks. And yet you know intellectually that the upside-downness is untrue. Why don't you just as an experiment try convincing yourself intellectually that it doesn't matter a damn and refusing, even for a single second, to experience the faintest feeling of misery. And you know, I did it for a whole week when I woke up in the middle of the night. I deliberately kept my will so tense that not the slightest feeling of defeat or misery crept in. And at the end of this two weeks, I suddenly realized that, you know, the emotions suddenly came out of their slough of despond, and the intellect looked down on them with contempt and said, you bloody fools, I told you so. And I knew, in a sense, that I beat it. Now, this seems to me the, the essence of the, of the problem. I got a feeling that we've somehow got to get up there. Yeah, besides, you know, although Richard says that um, he doesn't really believe this, I found this speech in a play of his called Lava. One night, a situation in my private life brought me frustration. Nothing major, but frustration. And in irritation, I threw myself down on my bed with a feeling of giving up. At that moment, everything changed as if a switch had been thrown and the basis of my consciousness changed. It was as if my head were replaced with a glass sphere perhaps six feet in diameter and everything in the outside world was seen as tiny images on that sphere. But those images projected somehow from the inside as if their real source was inside me. And this was accompanied by a feeling of joy and light and the sense that everything had been resolved once and for all and there was nothing but completion and happiness in the world. And this state lasted in me for 20 minutes. Then it began to fade. And for perhaps half an hour, though it had gone, I could remember the feeling. Then I slept. And when I awoke, I could remember that I'd had the experience but I could only remember the feeling in the form I could describe to myself in language, but no longer the real feeling as a feeling memory. Well, to me, that moment of paradise was the only experience I've ever had that I trusted that wasn't off the mark, off the mark, displaced, but free of the kind of slight mismatch that infects all experience and language and saying and memory as I see it. Even myself, which is worse, what is that singular experience? I've lost it. Uh, that happened to me, and in my terms, Colin, I put that down. I say, that's a postcard. That's a postcard about the experience. Uh, and then I spend my life trying to make a kind of art which is, in a sense, uh, an art focused on the way that language in its stumbling, in its inevitable failure, casts something on that dome of the play, of the theatrical event. You see, Colin is lucky. He's healthy, so he's talking to you about life <laughs> and saying, this is the way it could be, this is the way it should be. Uh, I don't know if I'm healthy or not healthy, but uh, my interest in art is the interest not in making my life stumble, because certainly my life is subjected to the same problems and, or other but similar vicissitudes, to the, as is the life of Colin Wilson, but uh, I am dealing, or trying to deal, with a language, not only the, the English language, but the visual language of the arts, the oral language of the arts, the rhythmic language of the arts, that it seems to me, by definition, the minute they are employed, and they are the only tools we have, 
The minute those tools are employed, they create this second reality, which is a kind of decorated prison. And by attacking my very own language with a sledgehammer and fragmenting it and making it obscure in the way that uh, many 20th century poets do, you are attempting to have your tools in the way that they are deflected from their goal reflect in that deflection something of the real that the given languages cannot really make contact with. I was very interested to discover in Richard's flat a whole shelf full of Derrida, Jacques Derrida, the modern French philosopher. I took um, two years to try to understand Derrida and finally concluded that what he was saying was rubbish. But uh, this um, offered me a, an interesting clue because suddenly I saw that the one other writer of the 20th century um, that I feel had some kinship with Richard was Hugo von Hofmannsthal. Um, Hofmannsthal uh, wrote a letter, the letter of um, Lord Chandos to Francis Bacon, in which he said that he felt that language was continually telling lies about reality and that consequently he'd become almost incapable of speaking because he'd become so disgusted by language and the way it distorted reality. And Hofmannsthal's other work that struck me as so important is his play The Difficult Man, which is the most extraordinary masterpiece of the 20th century. I do urge every one of you to read this. It's an amazing piece of work. It's the only attempt in the 20th century to create a kind of Superman, but a Superman that Richard would completely understand. The hero of the play, a man called Carrie Buell, is a member of the Viennese upper class, and he's widely admired because he's modest, and yet obviously clever, and at the same time, um, seldom says very much. And he explains to his intimates that the reason he doesn't say very much is that language creates a whole absurd series of misunderstandings which leave him far worse off than when he started to speak. And the play is an illustration of this absurdity of human language. Uh, and this is done in the most subtle and interesting way. Normally it would be very difficult to write a play about a man who doesn't speak much. But by putting on stage a series of characters who do speak and who are obviously stupid and then showing contrasted to them this man who obviously feels subtly no you know this doesn't express what I'm feeling his um, sister says to him can you persuade this beautiful young girl to marry my son I'm Carl and he said yep okay I don't really want to because language always lands me in trouble but yeah okay since you asked me, I'll do my best. And then his best friend, who's been with him through the war, and who's generally regarded as pretty stupid by other people, says, Look, try and persuade my wife to come back to me, will you? Now, he has a secret. He's had an affair with the man's wife. And the man's wife, in fact, wants to marry him. So he knows he's in an appallingly complex and difficult situation. And when the maid of the wife comes along to him and says, you know, my mistress is longing to see you, he says, you know, why don't you tell her to go back to her husband? And she says, oh, my God, sir, that's not what we want to hear. And that we is the deeply interesting. The maid identifying with her mistress and um, because that gives her a certain cachet, a certain power, a certain self-esteem. And that's what the play is about, this, the way that people lie to themselves, the varieties of human self-delusion. Anyway, in due course, Carrie agrees to go to a party, which he had refused to go to originally, in order to try to persuade the wife to go back to her husband, which he finally does with sort of by appealing to her sentimentality and saying, well, they'll always love one another, but, you know, she must do the right thing and so on. He then tries to persuade this girl, Helen, to marry his nephew. And Helen replies that, you know, in point of fact, she's in love with him. And he staggers backwards and being a gentleman, can't possibly say, oh, go away, I don't want you. 
and he's forced himself to say, okay, we'll get married, and then has to go in shame to his sister and say, look, I'm terribly sorry, I persuaded to marry, but to marry me. <laughs> and his nephew takes it as a Viennese gentleman would. But, you know, at the end of the play, he obviously feels, this is what you do when you commit yourself to language. It always screws you up. Life is infinitely more subtle. It seems to me that this is basically the kind of underlying feeling um, in Richard's plays. Except I would not uh, claim that he would be a hero uh, of mine because I do not believe uh, in the removal from the corruption of life, the corruption of language. Uh, I don't believe in that kind of purity. And I would say that I would rather favor, in the other spiritual tradition, that kind of crazy wisdom. Uh, I would prefer a language. You remember? You all remember how uh, Gurdjieff would mangle the English language on purpose? Not on purpose? Well, who knows? Not that it matters particularly, but the very uh, absurdity and stumblingness and stupidity at times of his syntax, one can assume, one can postulate, was making a kind of prickliness akin to what the Russian formalist art critics used to call making you know, perception difficult. In other words, uh, when I grew up as a young man and was sort of introduced to art, the people I was reading when I was in high school and college basically were selling me the idea that, well, the function of art is to make things more organic than life, to uh, you know, find the good gestalt that will go down more easily. The Russian formalists, who then became influential through French theorists and German theorists later on, were saying, oh, no, the task of art is to make perception more prickly so that uh, when you are swallowing the idea of a tree, all the little pine needles and so forth as they go down in your, your throat, your mental throat as you were swallowing it, force you to say, oh yeah, oh Jesus, this is really, this is a tree, right? And you are not just relating to the easily acceptable idea of a tree. So I would say that I would prefer, I, you know, it's very funny, when we're rehearsing, one of the things I always tell my actors uh, my plays are full of uh, non sequiturs and stupid conscious, I think, stupidities of various sorts. And I always tell them, you must assume that everything you say, especially the stupid responses, are absolutely, for that moment in the play, the most subtle, brilliant move in the world's finest chess game that you've ever experienced. So, uh, he would not be my hero, actually. I understand why you're saying that, and I understand the relationship to aspects of the thematics I'm interested in. But I prefer the, the rough and tumble of how to redeem from the inside the failure rather than trying to clean it up so the failure can be avoided. Because the failure is all we have. Those tools, that tool of that awful language is all we have, I think. Um, I really want to put a gloss on what Richard says by um, reading from his book Unbalancing Acts, which he starts by saying, um, my theater has always tried to spotlight the most elusive aspects of the experience of being human. Human beings are to a great extent unknowable to themselves. Passing through each of us is a continual flow of motor and emotional impulses we're taught to give conventional names, hunger, lust, aversion, attraction. But these labels are neither truthful nor accurate, condensing our wide field of impulses into a few nameable categories, suppresses our awareness of the infinity of tones and feeling gradations that are part of the original impulse. As each impulse is shaped in accordance with a limited number of labels available in, in a society, the sense of contact with their original ambiguous flavor is lost. Perhaps your impulse has a certain flavor that relates it to hunger or lust, but 
is neither fully one nor the other. Without a name of its own, its unique truth disappears, rechanneled into one of the already named desires. Now, I want to jump to a slightly later passage here. I'm not paying Colin. I mean, <laughs> he is working for me for free. <laughs> uh, he says, what my plays say in effect, and this seems to me to be the, one of the central quotations, what my plays say in effect is that not all the problems of life can be resolved within the accepted terms of the materialist culture we've inherited. In fact, the most important ones cannot. This is an approach to art that puts it in direct opposition to the mythos of the mainstream, business-oriented culture of the late 20th century. There's no question that serious 20th century art functions as an adversary to the going culture. That's why the powers that be, secretly or not so secretly, uh, consider adventurous, serious art of the modern era subversive. It is subversive. It implies that the cultural choices we've made are wrong, which is, of course, a disturbing message. Mainstream art, on the other hand, even when it's seemingly critical on a specific issue, can only be revisionist at best. So I see the essence of Richard as this particular um, kind of revolt. He says on the next page, from the time I was 15, I found theater much too concerned with actors trying to make audiences love them by being over emotional and manipulative. So I thought a non-acting performance style working with tape dialogue would be a simple way to deal with the problem. And he then goes on to say these tape techniques were also inspired by the sound manipulations of musicians like Lamonte, Young, Phil Glass and Steve Reich, whom I'd heard in concerts. Lamonte's pieces, for instance, were loud, continuous tones, drones with no real variation for minutes at a time, which made you listen to sound itself in a deep, different way. Now, um, this I understand. This, this seems to me, you know, perfectly true, and, you know, particularly of music. And I very much enjoy, you know, minimalist music. My mother used to hate it. She couldn't see why I put on things like Einstein on the beach. Um, I enjoy this um, very much. At the same time, I feel that this um, is simply a kind of uh, revolt which tells you more about the artist than about the world. And I remain basically interested in the world itself. I mean, you know, I, I want to know about the world. Bertrand Russell said philosophy is an attempt to understand the universe. He also said, and I loathe Bertrand Russell, I should say, he seems to me an idiot. But nevertheless, he also said in a letter to his girlfriend, Constance Mallison, something like, what I've always wanted to say, what I've never yet succeeded in saying, um, is not love pity or hate or misery, but an immense cold wind blowing from far off, bringing into human life the immense passionless force of non-human things. Now, you know, that seems to me what science is about, which is, you know, why I love science. I started life as a scientist. At the age of 10, someone gave me a chemistry set by the age of 12, I was reading Einstein on relativity, and I wanted to be a physicist. It was only when I left school at 16 that I started uh, reading poetry out of sheer misery and frustration and decided I wanted to be a writer instead. So that when I went back to school to take um, exams to, for my BSc, I totally lost interest in science. And yet, you know, I remain basically a scientist. What I want to do is to understand human existence, to understand these emotions. So, in a sense, I'm very grateful to Richard for bringing this to my attention and forcing me to consider it. I'm also very grateful, you know, for the sheer amusement that he afforded me the other evening watching I've Got the Shakes. But I'm still inclined to wonder, 
whether uh, there's a basic fallacy here, to be honest. Simon de Beauvoir once said, I look in a mirror, I tell myself the story of my own life, um, but it's not real. I feel that I am not. Now, everybody understands that. Everybody can look in a mirror, tell themselves their own story, and not believe it. In fact, if you look in a mirror for long enough, just stare blankly into a mirror, you suddenly get a feeling of horror as you forget that it's you you are looking at, and this feeling that Sartre calls nausea or the absurd overwhelms you. And yet, you know, in a sense, the person in the mirror is the real you. And there's no doubt whatever that all that has happened is that you put yourself in a state of mind in which the real you has, so to speak, disappeared. Now, it always seemed to me that the real solution to the problem is extremely interesting. When we become bored, it is as if the mind spread apart like a lot of billiard balls on the surface of a billiard table. You have this sense of non-connectiveness, non-contact. As soon as something interests you, you focus, and it's as if the billiard balls were pulled together by a sort of force of gravity until they come together in the middle of the table. If you get really excited and deeply interested, it's as if the billiard balls began to climb on top of one another, forming a second row. Now, that's as far as I've ever gone. But I can also see that if I became sufficiently deeply interested, the billiard balls would get into a third row and then a fourth row and would eventually form a pyramid. And that if we could once get to the pyramid, the pyramid would never collapse because you would be so deeply interested, you would find life so fascinating that you would hold the pyramid together permanently. And when that happens, man would have changed to something beyond the mere animal. Now this remains my basic vision and my answer to the question of Simon de Beauvoir looking into a mirror. This is why I can't help feeling that existentialism, which is basically negative, Sartre's man is a useless passion, Derrida's feeling that language speaks us, we don't speak language, and so on, um, is fundamentally, philosophically speaking, a wrong direction, which has to be changed, which has to be pointed in another direction. Richard said, you know, the world is not going to change because Colin Wilson's philosophy um, appears to have... Uh, <clears throat> I, the only thing that bothers me about all of this is A, the, uh, the structure that you're creating with the billiard balls, I still would maintain, is the creating of this second reality that is, in a, a sense, closing you off from the potent energy of that space, that empty space between the billiard balls which, when they are displayed like that on the billiard table, you say produces, is, is, is an image, is a metaphor for your state of boredom before you have organized them. Yeah. I would say that as a scientist, and I am being also fascinated by science, and thinking of myself as an artist scientist, uh, I am interested in that space between the billiard balls when I am in the state of funk, and creating an art that I would uh, enjoy fantasizing for myself, will discover not the rules and the experience of life as we are living it now, but perhaps the beginning to creep in, the interpenetration of a different kind of energy that is not the energy of the way these heads of ours are functioning now. When we were out there in the hall, you were talking about ancient Egypt and how you're so fascinated with ancient Egypt, writing a book about the Sphinx, and coming to the conclusion that perhaps the ancient Egyptians used their heads, used their consciousness in a way totally different from the way we use it today. Yeah, yeah I would say that as a scientist, I 
am trying to find a different way to use my head. Yep, I, and I very much see your point. In fact, that makes your point absolutely clear. But um, that also um, underlines my own basic problem here. You see, the reason that I feel the ancient Egyptians probably saw life in a totally different way from the way that we do um, is that they had a quite different type of consciousness. This is not me, by the way. This is an extremely interesting man called Chuala de Lubic, a kind of maverick Egyptologist who was fascinated by alchemy and the, um, the architecture of medieval cathedrals, uh, who then went to um, Egypt and in the Temple of Luxor felt that he'd found some absolutely basic secret. I was written an enormous number of books about this, the biggest being a book called The Temple of Man. Now, Shuala has me absolutely convinced that the ancient Egyptians saw things in a quite different way. One, one way in which he tries to explain this difference is to say, um, if a modern man looks at a green spot and then closes his eyes, he will see a red spot inside his eyelids, the complementary color. And he would say, well, the reality is the green spot out there and the red spot inside my eyes is somehow an illusion. He says, the ancient Egyptians would have said, the red spot behind my eyelids is the truth because that is inside me. It is the green spot out there that's somehow the illusion. Now, what that appears to imply is that there is a sense in which, now, what you're expecting me to say, I know, is that there's a sense in which we project the external world. Well, no, I don't think that's what Shuala meant at all. There is a sense in which we are not subject to the external world, you know, what Sartre calls contingent, dangled in its hands like a puppet in the hands of a master. That in some weird way, when the Egyptians built their temples, they were projecting this notion that the inner spiritual reality is so powerful that it eventually has total control of the external world. Now, I think, and this is only a theory, I think they were able to do that because um, they did not have our use of intellect and of words. I think they saw the world symbolically. And, you know, here we're going back to what I was saying earlier about the whole tradition of symbolism in Western art, which at the moment seems to me to find you know, its clearest expression in Richard's plays. They saw the world in a sense symbolically and they did this because they weren't using words and language in our sense. Rudolf Steiner, who I agree is no authority, once said that the people of Atlantis did not have language but that their memory was so extraordinary that they didn't need language. Now it did seem to me that he'd really hit the nail on the head there the ancient Greeks, you know, um, knew things like the Odyssey and the Iliad by heart. They didn't write them down. People used to sit down and recite thousands and thousands and thousands of lines, word for word. It was already there inside them. And I don't think they did this by memory. They did it more by a kind of instinct. Now, if you can imagine a world in which this is true, in which people have a completely different approach to the whole reality because in some way, they're established in a feeling of total inner certainty, like when you sort of had two large martinis. <laughs> uh, now, this seems to me very interesting and important, this notion of being so totally established in an inner reality that the outer reality has no power over you. The real problem with this is that all animals appear to have something of the sort. They appear, for example, to have um, powers that we don't possess. I'm absolutely convinced that animals have psychic powers. My dog seems to know what I'm thinking and what I'm intending to go out. Uh, we, I feel, have deliberately got rid of these powers because we don't need them, or rather, because if we're going to develop our real powers, the powers of language, the powers of pinning, pinning things down digitally, so to speak, we don't have room for these other powers. Nietzsche once said, um, we envy the cows because they seem so happy. 
But the problem, if you said to a cow, why are you so happy, is that it would have forgotten the question before it could answer. <laughs> Excuse me, Colin and Richard? Walt Whitman said something very similar about the cows. Uh, it seems to me that there's the animal mode of perception, this deep inner certainty, this oneness with the universe, is something we've deliberately foregone because we suddenly discover that pinning things down in words is ultimately a far better way of achieving knowledge, a far more boring way, a far more futile way, a far more alienating way, but it works in the long run. And what human beings are going for is the long run. It seems to me that the feeling of absurdity and nausea and alienation um, is simply a feeling of, for Christ's sake, let's get rid of all this bloody stupid language and knowledge and science and get back to something more fundamental. And you know, for me, this is just not true. Um, it may be true for Richard because it's obviously a deeply personal thing. But for me, this is just not true. Oh, but you see, it's... Uh, I see Tom me, wants to um, people into this, but I just have to say that I have... Language is my medium, and I have ultimate faith in my medium, but the very imperfection of the medium is the... Win, is the creation of continual spark gaps that have to be jumped by consciousness, which is the very root, I think, of creativity and mental development. If language really worked, I think it would be over. Um, but I love language. <laughs> no, would the, Colin, so, excuse me, <laughs> would you be willing to, uh, would you gentlemen be willing to uh, field some questions from the audience? Well, let, can I just answer that one, Tom? <laughs> can I just answer that, that, that single one first? Because this seems to me a, a okay, very interesting and then, point. Uh, feel free to ask questions. <laughs> okay. That, that seems to me a very interesting point about the problem of language. I'm aware all the time of the inadequacy of language. For example, how would you describe the difference between the taste of an orange and a tangerine? Obviously, you couldn't do it. Our language is inadequate. You know when you make the word P, P, and when you make the word B, B, try doing it. What, what's the difference? How, how do you do it with your lips? P, B, what do you do? Try it, P, B, what's the difference? Can anybody explain it to me? Yeah, P is more out. <laughs> P, B. P, B. You mean you do P with the front of your lips and B with the back? Ah. <laughs> 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 Well, Anthony Burgess once explained something of the sort to me. But what I'm trying to say is that as soon as you recognize these curious subtleties of language, you realize that there's a vast amount, the gaps between our knowledge. Language is just occasional words in an immense sea of darkness. And sooner or later, you know, in a half a million years' time, there's not going to be any sea of darkness we should have words that will describe precisely the difference between the taste of an orange and a tangerine, just as apparently we now have a means of explaining the difference between p and b. So it seems to me that the answer must be, you know, okay, let's get to work. Let's start filling in those gaps. Let's start being scientific about it. Sorry, no. Tom, do you want to, there are people waving their hands. Do you want us to recognize them or do you? 
No, we, the, the description was written, we had nothing to do with the description. <laughs> No, we have no rules. We have no we have no rules. So what's your solution? Richard, it sounds as if you're to blame. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, totally, I totally disapprove of, of events like this. I really do. No. Uh, I, 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 I have always felt, because I, I do you know, occasionally go and speak and participate in things like this, and I have always felt that um, they evoked in me a kind of energy that I did not trust, uh, an ego trip kind of energy. Uh, I relate this to the fact, I, I, I feel also that in directing plays, the same kind of energy is manifest in me that I do not trust. I feel that when I am writing my texts, I am writing, and you see, and this is where, again, where I differ uh, a bit uh, from Colin. I feel that I am writing out of a state of lethargic passivity. I feel that uh, in writing, I am much more in touch with the incoherence that possibly can introduce some other level into my mechanism than taking that text produced incoherently, passively. I have to stage it, and I have to confront a group of actors. And I do not have the courage in my own life to confront my actors with the same kind of helplessness that I dare to confront the blank page. I want to make an impression upon my actors, just as we are up here and we want to be able to speak so that when we, I assume Colin has the same feeling, that when he leaves, he doesn't want everybody to say, oh, that Colin Wilson, he was an inarticulate dope. No, Colin wants to feel, hey, those people probably liked me or thought I was intelligent. Uh, I, I think that's, and I, I certainly feel that way, but I wonder about that. I'm very suspicious about those motives <laughs> that bring us here to this platform. <laughs> it goes beyond liking the world and lowering indifference to these words. It takes a lot 
<laughs> yeah, then this is um, very much my own approach, obviously. Um, the Outside, it was an absolutely personal book written out of the fact that I was born a working class boy in Leicester with no possible way of getting out of this damn treadmill of working in factories as my father had done all his life and as my brothers still do. And uh, this sheer frustration led me to formulate the concept of the outsider. Um, I was startled that it um, resonated so much and immediately found myself in this extremely false position of being a famous writer. Uh, this I found, in a way, quite horrific. Um, it was a continual distorting mirror. You gave an interview. Um, what came out in the newspaper just had no relation to what you'd said. It went through a distorting machine, kind of distorting mirror. Um, events like this were slightly better, except that, as Richard says, there's always this problem of, you know, the ego trip. And uh, I think, you know, anybody uh, who worries about this kind of thing is perfectly sensible. Because if you go on an ego trip, it's almost impossible to get back to the point inside yourself where you're really doing some good thinking, which comes out of an intuition um, deep inside you. And yet, uh, I still feel very strongly that what I try to do if I'm talking um, is to say completely honestly uh, what I feel. And above all, it doesn't have any resonance for me afterwards. I forget it. I just get back to the dreary problems of the things I've got to write next and the next book I've got to finish. In The Outsider, I said, the outsider has to learn to stand completely alone. Every individual has to learn to stand completely alone. And I feel this very strongly and deeply. Somehow, Blake said, you know, the angel that presided at my birth said, little creature born of joy and mirth, go, love without the help of anything on earth. And unless you can be strong enough to actually live up to that to some extent, which means, you know, not um, requiring the sort of obvious prop that will keep you floating along in a state of happy egoism, then you don't stand a chance of evolving to a higher stage, which, you know, comes through sheer hard work. Here am I, you know, at 64, still as broke as I was when I was 24, and still, um, you know, facing the same kind of problems. But I realized that when I was 24, Iris Murdoch once said to me at a party, um, what do you really want? And I said, what I want is to live to be 300 as Shaw suggested, him back to Methuselah. Now, I realized that that would have been totally impossible if I'd continued to have the same kind of success that I got at the time of The Outsider. Um, whether I liked it or not, it was kind of anesthetic. And also, it made me terribly self-conscious. It was like having people looking over your shoulder when you're trying to write and your hand freezes up. Uh, suddenly being attacked put me once again in the cold. But, you know, I once again felt healthy. Now I feel that, in a sense, life was answering my request. Okay, um, we'll show you the basic conditions. If you really want to live to be 300 or even to be 90, what you have to do is make enormous efforts day after day after day. And if you're still making the same enormous efforts when you were 85, then you've probably got five years' work left in you. What I would love to do, what I would love to be my epitaph, I would love to write a masterpiece at a greater age than anybody has ever done it so far, at something like 95. That I feel would be a really great thing. And I realize the only way I can do that is to suffer. 
safer now. No. On the other hand, the play the other evening seemed to me to be entirely successful in its own terms, and it kept the audience amused and totally attentive. So in a sense, Richard um, has achieved the ability to produce a completely successful product, if you don't mind the word. Within this little ghetto of <laughs> the experimental New York theater scene, it is a tiny ghetto. Hmm. Let's jump in. I guess I'll be the master of ceremonies. Yeah, you. <laughs> It seems to me you're being a bit unfair to Richard because it, it, it seems to me that you're being unfair to Richard and that he really is trying to advance um, over shaky ground. I said to him the other evening, um, is the play that's on this evening um, one of your old plays? And he said, oh no, I wouldn't dream of putting an old play on again. Uh, obviously, this desire to keep on going into new territory. Yeah, Colin, I must tell you there are a lot of people in New York who think he is doing the same play over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I just don't think I'll ever be able to do it. Well, are you about to offer us this way? I'm not sure. I'm not joking, but I'm in the phone book. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not joking. 
Also, um, I found myself saying again and again, in California I found that I was being put up by the disciples of a man called Dafri John. And uh, they were very nice people, I must say. And I listened for hours to Dafri John talking on tape. Um, they said he sometimes talked for as much as 17 hours at a time. And uh, I kept saying, you know, okay, this is all very well, but the answer's so incredibly simple. You don't need to listen for 17 hours. And what's more, you don't need a master. A friend of mine wrote a book called Call No Man Master. My feeling is you don't need a master because the answer is incredibly simple. But I can tell you what the answer is in about three sentences. Uh, whenever we are faced with some great crisis, we suddenly experience a state of appalling inattention and if the crisis goes away, we heave a great sigh of relief and go into a state that a friend of mine calls happy expansiveness, in which life is seen to be entirely good. If you were told that you had cancer, and then suddenly a doctor said, that's nonsense, I've just x-rayed you, it's not a cancer, it's something else, you'd go into a state of happy expansiveness. Now, if you think of it, at the moment you don't have cancer, and yet, you are not in a state of happy expansiveness. Do you see the absurdity of this? When a problem suddenly presents itself to you and then goes away, you feel a state of happy expansiveness and the sheer wonderfulness of the world. But you're only back in the same position you were in before the problem presented itself. So in a state sense, we have to recognize the fact that we are at the moment um, in a state in which we should be ecstatically happy. In fact, the truth is that we are really ecstatically happy and we just don't realize it. <laughs> now, Colin, I'm... Isn't, is that simple enough? <laughs> Colin, I'm glad you got to that point because that, the, the first note I had here about what I wanted to uh, say, because this is ostensibly, ostensibly about art, uh, what you are describing is what I believe interesting 20th century, which is spiritualist art, is trying to do because I think that the equivalent to the crises is the complexity, the tension. I think we need to be in a state of crisis and tension um, to some extent, but the problem is the state of tension in which we normally live, that is this state of non-happy expansiveness in which most of us live, um, is in fact a kind of tunnel vision. We live in a kind of tunnel vision. We human beings have developed the ability which cows do not have. You know, as Nietzsche says, the cows are so happy. That's because uh, they're at one, in a sense, with the universe. We have quite deliberately developed tunnel vision. The cow is looking at life through the normal end of a telescope and seeing broad perspectives. We have developed the ability to look at life through a microscope. This is what characterizes human beings. We can focus among the most precise little problems and solve them because we've got a kind of mental microscope rather than a telescope. Now what happens in these moments of crisis when suddenly you think, oh God, no! And then the crisis goes away as that you go, Whew! and you go into the telescope mode instead of the microscope. And you are seeing life from a bird's eye view instead of from a worm's eye view. Now, we, well, what I'm trying to say is, what would be ideal, obviously? You know, if you're in an art gallery, if you walk up too close to the paintings, you just see the texture of the paint. You don't really see the picture. If you stand too far back, you don't see the texture of the paint and you miss something about the picture, but you do see the form and shape. But you know, fortunately, you've got legs. You can move forward to the picture and back again from it. Now, what I'm trying to say is that we human beings have developed this microscope and we got stuck and jammed in the microscope in a kind of tunnel vision. And unless crisis comes along and suddenly makes us sigh with relief and go into the telescope, we cannot access the telescopic, the bird's eye vision. Now, what we've got to do at this next stage of our evolution
is to be capable of switching from the telescope to the microscope and back again exactly as we want to, just as you can stand back and forward from a picture in an art gallery. As soon as we've done this, I think we should have achieved the major step in human evolution that we've been moving towards for the past 5,000 years. Again, what is happening uh, in art. Uh, uh, Colin, are you familiar with the work of Anton Ahrenswijk? Uh, to me, the greatest book on art in the 20th century is Anton Ahrenswijk's The Psychoanalysis of Artistic Vision and Hearing. Uh, he wrote another, there was another posthumous book called The Hidden Order in Art that is more readily available. Uh, one of Ehrenzweig's, Ehrenzweig deals with the way uh, art evokes a kind of unconscious scanning in the viewer that transcends and is more powerful than the normal conscious sort of gestalt viewing. And he talks about how the energy of art comes as there is material in the image that fights with the clear gestalt, and it is that tension that produces great art. And he goes on to explain in his theory how what seem to be background squiggles in a certain period of art then becomes the actual content of the art in the next period. And I was just struck by your uh, image of being in the art gallery and standing too close because in fact maybe something besides us, maybe some kind of evolutionary force is taking over and teaching us, which is a great theme for me, that in those squiggles, in those moments of boredom, in that wrong focus, it is not just telling yourself, no, let's go back to the better focus, because our decision about what the better focus is, I think, is culturally conditioned. And if you stick with the bad focus, if you stick with the boredom, maybe you discover something that is the content of a new way of consciousness. Yep, I think that's probably a, a perfect summary of your work as I understand it. But you know, ju just another point though. For me, sticking with the boredom is not a valid alternative. Um, two or three weeks ago, I had to go and lecture in Tokyo and you know, with a result with a nine hour um, difference in time meant that uh, it was difficult to get over jet lag. Now I went there a day early to try and get over the jet lag, but the evening before I was due to lecture, uh, I had to go to somebody else's lecture in Japanese and I fell deeply asleep throughout the lecture, which screwed me up completely because when I got back to my hotel, I slept for half an hour and I lay awake from 11 o'clock at night until eight o'clock the next morning. I tried relaxing deeply, I tried concentrating, I tried all kinds of things. I could not get to sleep and I thought, oh my God, what kind of a lecture am I going to give this evening when I've had absolutely no sleep? But halfway through the night, I determined to treat this, you know, as a real challenge. I thought, for Christ's sake, two weeks ago in Kobe, the whole town fell down. And what's more, here in Tokyo, it's expected to fall down at any time. You know, they're already three or four years into the period when the earthquake should have occurred. It could happen at any moment. I thought, if this hotel really fell down and squashed me and my wife, I would really have problems. For Christ's sake, I haven't got real problems, just the fact that I haven't slept all night. And in fact, you know, by really pep-talking myself into this state, pushing myself up to a higher level of energy by contemplating disaster, you know, I, I gave a fairly good lecture. Now, this seems to me to be quite important. What I had to do was to break a kind of sound barrier quite u deliberately using my mind and pep-talking myself selling myself the confidence trick, getting myself out of the state of sloth and in fact, you know, of exhaustion and jet lag. And it seems to me that that's terribly important to do, to push yourself, to push. Growing up is learning to do things you don't want to do. And really growing up is pushing yourself furiously to do things you don't want to do. Now, good Jeff was always doing this with his disciples he was an absolute bastard. He would deliberately involve them in situations in which they felt they were going mad. Um, you know, they'd, he'd set up to catch a train and then deliberately miss it and then told the disciple to rush along and tell the engine driver to wait because, you know, he would be there in five minutes and this kind of thing. Then on the train, he would do the most appalling things, produce some cheese that stank so much that everybody in the carriage rushed out and vomited and so on. Uh, he'd deliberately do this to create for the disciple um, such difficulties that he was really forced to get himself out of his normal state of mind. Now, that's all very well if you've got a good GF around to do this for you, but um, 
The real trick is doing it for yourself. Now, fortunately, life does this to me all the time. <laughs> and I keep trying to respond as if life is my good, Jeff. This is, uh, in, a, in, a, in a profoundly serious sense, that's too hypothetical for me to have too much of an opinion about. It. That being said, I've learned a great deal from Colin. Now, here I am, sitting here. Uh, a, lot of a lot of Colin is built into me. Uh, I am simply trying to be careful in my life that I don't fall into the trap, as I think often happens to practically everybody I know, of taking the particular solution, the particular scheme, and using that as some kind of efficient, comfortable vehicle that's going to carry you someplace. And in that trip, you're so committed to your vehicle that you're going to miss some little jewels lying at the side of the road or some, you know, little, uh, you know, or you're eating something and you throw it out to that vehicle, you finished lunch and you throw out the cardboard container and little do you know that that cardboard container, that piece of trash, uh, represents something I don't wholly approve of, but take what's happening in architecture today. You know, in architecture there's a big mo uh, movement to say, well, it started with that famous book, Learning from Las Vegas, where uh, architects decided, no, uh, the, the edifice complex of the whole history of architecture up through the modernist movement is now going to be superseded. We're going to deal with the reality of Las Vegas and, their, and the junk, and I think it's junk you know, in Las Vegas, but now you start to see how there actually are architects using that neon, that superimposition of this the multifaceted nature of that to actually produce some very rarefied, mind-blowing new work that I never thought would happen. Because when, it, when that movement began, I thought, my God, this is the latest garbage. But no, I think it's really growing into something else. So I'm concerned, and I'm interested to see if, you know, this is, I'm, I'm trying to take a slightly polemical stance here, as I have my whole life, in order to keep things moving. So I certainly, but I can't answer your question. It's too hypothetical. Uh, I think it's a well-phrased question, but I don't have the faintest clue. 
I think other things become, other things become the, the grain of sand that the oyster tries to spin his pearl around. So you transcend that cheapo sand that was the boredom of 10 years ago, and you discover that what seemed to be a pearl as you advance is really just another grain of sand to be covered over by the new pearl, which after a while is the grain of sand that has to be recovered. <laughs> You know, Dr. Johnson said he kept trying to be a philosopher, but unfortunately cheerfulness kept breaking in. And um, Graham Greene, in the same way, towards the end of his life, found he was losing his artistic power because he was getting more and more cheerful and losing this grim point of view. Um, so I do see the necessity of, um, you know, keeping this grain of sand. Um, as I say, fortunately, life keeps providing it for me anyway without needing to look around for it. Also, you know, boredom is, um, I once said, rarer than radium. If you think of the species on this earth who struggled and struggled, who have been wiped out, even if you think of the present species in the 20th century, if you think of things like Auschwitz or Tiananmen Square, you suddenly see that, you know, we, we're still up against it in a fairly serious sense. Uh, this means that for somebody actually to be able to yawn and say I'm bored is an extraordinary thing in the history of the evolution of this planet. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a high degree of sophistication. I think we tend to think of boredom within the frame. I mean, it's set with, you know, I'm sure you must have gone to a movie which defines, you know, okay, this space of time. Within this space of time, you're either going to be bored or you're going to be excited. Uh, one has a more serious problem if one is bored with one's entire life, yes, but often we're referring to much more localized phenomena and what we can learn from that level of boredom. I think that if, I don't know, I won't say that. No. No. <laughs> you know, because my, because I, <laughs> I know what I'm going to say, and I'm not going to say anything more tonight. The, fi the ultimate thing that I've been able to come up with that sort of defines my position is to say that indeed uh, I've reached the point where pretty much everything has lost interest for me and yet I'm really interested. Mm -hmm. Not in that, not in that, not in that. I don't know in what, but I'm really interested. No, actually, there's, there's a very simple fallacy which I can explain in one sentence. Um, when I was young, I felt that life um, was going to be totally futile and meaningless, that I was going to die um, feeling that I hadn't lived. And those lines of T.S. Eliot, birth, copulation, and death, birth, copulation, and death, that's all the facts when you get to brass tacks, birth, copulation, and death. And I realized that I didn't want to live on this level of birth, copulation, and death. There had to be something deeper. So it's not a question of escaping boredom. 
It's this simple instinct for something deeper than birth, copulation, and death. And it's the feeling that in certain moments, um, but particularly in moments when I made some tremendous effort that has left me exhausted, almost like vomiting, um, I reach this deeper level and I can see the way to hold on to it. Uh, little by little, I'm learning this trick of holding on to it. And it really is a trick of existing on this deeper level. Jung once said um, that nearly all the patients he'd had who were over middle age had problems that were basically religious problems. He also said that he thought all psychological illness sprang from a sense of the total purposelessness of life. Viktor Frankl, um, the Viennese psychiatrist, talked about what he called nothingness neurosis. Again, the feeling that life is meaningless and futile. And that's because we all have this instinct that life is not meaningless and futile. There's a deeper level and you've some, and, and our deepest instinct is to get down there. It's as deep as the instinct to eat and drink. Somehow we've just got to do it. Now it seems to me that in the people I called outsiders, this, in, this, this obsession is stronger and deeper than in most people, whom I suppose you know you classify as insiders. And this seems to me to be the great division in the modern world between the obsessives who are outsiders and who often don't quite understand why they're so deeply dissatisfied and the insiders who feel sort of fairly happy about human existence. That's the real um, distinction. It's not an escape from boredom at all, but from a sense of futility. Well, um, if there are any more questions, um, please feel free to ask them now um, because we're going to uh, end in a few minutes, uh, well, shortly. Um, so if there's any more that, uh, anything else that anyone would like to discuss, please feel free to pipe up at this time. And, um, Can I ask Richard a purely technical question? What struck me watching this play the other evening, which I found absolutely fascinating, was nevertheless um, the problem of where it would end. I couldn't see that there was any particular point where it should end. And in fact, when it did end, I thought, you know, well, it could have gone on for another 10 minutes or stopped 10 minutes earlier. How do you decide where a play ends? <laughs> uh, for me, uh, for me, <laughs> uh, it's, a well, that's difficult to answer because to me, uh, what I struggle with most is the ending and the sense of closure that I think comes in a kind of musical form. I think that my plays all have similar kinds of almost Aristotelian or musical sonata form structures. And I recognize it from play to play that, again, just as you, we don't have yet words for apples and oranges, I don't have a word for the kind of brouhaha of the first quarter of the play. And then settling into the kind of quotation of an older theatrical style in the next quarter of the play, in this case with the, the Jewish uh, rabbi with the ice cream and so forth and sort of shtick then the next quarter falling into a slightly more metaphysical level where in this play they're talking about climbing mountains and what that symbolically represents and in the end turning against all of that and saying to the audience and to myself most of all you bought that well it didn't work you know the, a, a kind of bitterness of saying no you didn't go far enough you didn't try hard enough and I, I think there is that kind of structure in the play Okay, sorry, that's my stupidity. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> Stupid in a way nobody can possibly notice. <laughs> No, I, I suppose, I mean, to be honest with you, I believe from the age of 10 that I was a man of genius. And um, also, to be honest, I've never wavered for a moment in that conviction. 
But um, you just did. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what began to strike me as I um, got older was that um, the state I'd called genius when I was young, thinking of it as something that Einstein or Bernard Shaw had, was in fact a sudden state of power which all human beings are capable of experiencing. Then it suddenly seemed to me that the answer to this is very simple. All human beings possess enormous levels of power that they don't even begin to recognize, very often because they're not pushed far enough, but very often simply, you know, because um, they haven't had the experience that suddenly makes them see, glimpse the power so that they go after it. On a very simple, crude level, Uri Geller, who is genuinely able to do things like, you know, bending spoons and so on, um, developed this power apparently accidentally when he was a child by sticking his finger into his mother's sewing machine, which blew him across the room. And he said that sort of when he woke up, he found that he had this ability to bend spoons. Now, if we could find some way of releasing the genius in all of us by something as simple as sticking our fingers into an electric point, we really would have something. <laughs> Well, if there uh, aren't any further questions, um, I would like to uh, thank everyone for uh, attending. I hope that uh, you enjoyed yourselves and were able to uh, enjoy the lively exchange which took place tonight. Um, once again, um, there, are, um, there was a tape recording done of this event. Uh, unedited tapes are available by, by mail order if you'd like. Um, just talk to Kevin uh, from uh, Sound Horizons. And uh, to those who are new to the Open Center, uh, our programs are very often uh, you know, interesting and stimulating in just the ways that you've seen tonight. So I would welcome you to return and experience more of what we have to offer. And also, uh, I'd like to thank Colin Wilson and Richard Foreman for their time and uh, very uh, eloquent presentations. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Uh, be safe and be well.